Hello, everyone. Welcome to our discursive event in the frame of a uh, twist exhibition. We are right now in the NGBK office um, at the Oranienstrasse, and uh, this um, event is being co hosted by NGBK and also uh, Chromatic Wednesdays um, project, which is run by Melissa Rigol, Emre Birishman, an apartment project. Um, and I think um, it will be streaming in both uh, sides of the uh, two institutions. Um, so uh, let me very briefly summarize the thematic framework of our exhibition downstairs. Um, so um, it developed as a kind of a framework which warned about potential um, destructive uh, consequences of nationalist ideology, uh, particularly in um, the East Mediterranean Basin. And uh, of course, uh, there are already existing um, concrete uh, conflicts. Uh, and uh, perhaps the second uh, um, theme of the exhibition is the absurdity of uh, nationalist ideologies in their claim on the geographical uh, units and uh, nature. And uh, a big part of the exhibition is concentrated on the experience of exile as a consequence of uh, the aggressive policies in uh, um, countries in conflict, uh, particularly in the region that we wanted to frame. Um, so the event that we are gonna have tonight has uh, two uh, different sessions. In the first round, uh, we are gonna host uh, um, two art people uh, and uh, artists um, from Syria. Um, from, I would say there's a nearly a generation um, difference between you two. <laughs> I just realized it after I uh, was uh, checking the um, birth dates. Um, um, and uh, they are, um, they have been working on platforms and networks that wanted to create um, a facilitation of uh, um, the practice of um, artists from Syria, either living in ex exile or still living in um, Syria. We're going to come uh, to that in detail. Um, in the second uh, round, uh, we're going to have. Uh, um, our guest, uh, Amina Mahar, uh, and uh, we're going to start with screening her um, video, uh, or uh, not with video, but film uh, from 2019, uh, Letter to My Mother. Um, the session will be moderated by Shirin Fulia Eransoy, uh, with the full name, and uh, it will also touch uh, the issue of the exodus of people um, because of their um, uh, queer subjectivity uh, from these uh, problematic, problematic regions and their contact with uh, the homeland. So um, um, I wanted to invite Khalid and Humam to this session because uh, um, I wanted to um, focus on the particular case of Syria. Of course, uh, when we were departing for the exhibition downstairs, we had in mind some um, uh, existing uh, tensions between Turkey and Greece and uh, a war uh, between Armenia and Azerbaijan followed in the uh, last summer uh, during our pre 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 uh, preparations. But of course there is um, the, uh, it's a quite a traumatic ex experience of Syria that we all have uh, somehow been influenced, uh, of course, um, it's uh, fully charged for people who um, have uh, been born there and who live there, but also, for example, um, in a neighboring country, uh, I'm from uh, Turkey, uh, four million Syrians are right now uh, living in uh, um, Turkey, and it is uh, uh, in the last couple of months, because of perhaps the economic uh, situation uh, in the country, uh, quite, uh, um, let's say, uh, frictious uh, events started to happen. And um, so the rise of the racistic uh, discourse is quite visible. Uh, and of course, uh, many countries have uh, 
um, different uh, experience with that. And uh, of course, we are living in Germany and uh, we have a considerable uh, amount of people who um, had to uh, um, migrate uh, from Syria um, to Germany. And I think uh, it is only one of the spots that is this concentration uh, um, somehow been uh, um, getting people from Syria. There's also France, which has considerable amount of people. And perhaps, uh, of course, you can correct me, but also Jordan. Um, is a um, uh, spot um, to uh, move to. Uh, I don't know the situation in Lebanon, uh, a another neighboring country, but they are also far away uh, geographies, such as Canada, as far as I know, uh, um, who received uh, um, people from Syria. Um, so um, the experience um, of exile is quite uh, fragmented in the case of um, Syrian people in the last decade. For example, when we think about uh, the recent uh, exodus from Turkey, we can say that, it, we can easily say that Berlin became um, uh, the, 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 the city uh, of the immigration, um, not only for people who have a knowledge on uh, German from beforehand, but also for, um, I mean, completely, uh, let's say, the creative classes, the academic academicians who had problems in Turkey, had, uh, had chosen um, the city of Berlin because of many reasons, because of the historical links or because of um, the benefits of the uh, welfare state uh, here or interest uh, that is being originating from the German uh, population. Uh, but uh, in the case of Syria, it is much more fragmented. So in that sense, um, the knowledge about the practice, ongoing practice uh, of uh, Syrian artists um, living in the exile, uh, and also uh, it's, it's completely a, a different uh, experience uh, for those who remained in Syria, but um, there are still ongoing uh, interaction and there's a need for them also to uh, have some kind of uh, bridge uh, between uh, their homeland and also uh, the outer world. So your um, you have initiated, co-founded uh, projects that somehow open up uh, this uh, um, interaction uh, somehow or, um, for those people. I wanted to um, uh, start with Humam, um, who was born in uh, um, 92. In Damascus, right. yeah. <laughs> yeah. and uh, so uh, before moving uh, to Germany in 2007, he already started a um, online project. Uh, Syria Art was uh, the title, uh, and uh, I believe uh, in 2014 it was transformed into a um, uh, 2016 yeah. non-governmental, uh, non-profit organization. And uh, with uh, the contribution of Dani Keshjan and uh, Khalid Youssef, uh, you are um, one of the active uh, members and co-founder of uh, the project. And um, um, next to Syria Art, um, um, you also, also curated uh, within the frame uh, of this project uh, exhibitions like You Are Not Alone and uh, Behind the Lines, which travel to many places. And um, uh, there's also, of course, an uh, anecdote about it, I guess. You, were, you have been curate, curating a lot of exhibitions, but you have been barely uh, to uh, the openings of these exhibitions because of many reasons, bureaucratical or um, fund-based uh, problems. But next to it, you have also an online uh, operating uh, gallery, Sirius uh, Gallery, which opened up in 2013 when you were already um, um, studying architecture, I guess, um, in uh, Damascus. And uh, you um, also gave the, um, I mean, this gallery is about, uh, it's, I think it's uh, a commercial gallery, which is to promote the practice of uh, Syrian artists. Um, and uh, there's also another um, project, Creative Heavens, which you are also contributing to, to 
correct me if I r say something no, it's, wrong, it's all true. Uh, which is based on the photographic documentation of Syrian artists working in their studio spaces, living in many parts of the globe. Um, so uh, you finished uh, your um, studies on architecture in 2015 and decided to come uh, to um, Germany. I, did you have also a period in France? No, I didn't. I okay. didn't live in France. So you Only came directly to uh, 2017. So um, um, I, um, before um, going to um, our second guest, Halit uh, Barakeh, I perhaps would like you to expand more about uh, this project um, in a little bit more detail. And then perhaps I can ask you a question about them, and then uh, we go on with uh, Halit, and then we will create a um, Q and A session. First, starting with my questions, and then we're gonna open up to the audience. Well, first, thank you for the introduction and for having us here. Um, the project started in 2012. It came out of a necessity to showcase the Syrian art online. Uh, there haven't been any kind of uh, archive at that time or any online platform that uh, where you can access all of the works or the artworks of the Syrian artists and have their biographies and their contact. So we wanted to uh, create this hub and create this online archive in the form of a social uh, media page, which was uh, what was within our capacity back then. And then slowly we started developing ideas so that um, the project can grow uh, bigger and um, realize more work uh, in reality. So um, it reached the point in which we uh, uh, registered this as a non-profit in uh, Nice, in France, where uh, uh, my partner in this project, uh, Khaled Youssef, is living. Um, the, our mission was solely to uh, promote the Syrian art in the international scene and try to help these artists, uh, especially emerging artists, uh, doing exhibitions in different places. Um, back then, of course, there were many uh, galleries and private galleries doing this, yeah? But we thought we want to do something online in the beginning, which can have this, um, like I said, like a hub where you can contact all of the artists in case you needed them, and especially the older ones, for example, in Syria. Uh, at that time, the digital uh, atmosphere wasn't uh, as right now, so not everyone had a website, not everyone had an email, I would say, and we wanted to create uh, uh, this sort of help, so to say, for them. And then, uh, yeah, like I said, the project grew bigger slowly with the time, and... Uh, Um, uh, so, um, of course, um, you use um, the name of the country in mm -hmm. the uh, title of the project that creates some sort of representational framing. Um, and uh, one thing that um, caught my eye uh, in the mission statement uh, of the project was that you um, define it uh, strictly a political, mm -hmm. uh, which um, probably uh, hint at a uh, po potential possible existing um, differences in political views uh, among uh, let's say possible contributors uh, to of, of, uh, of the artists uh, to be hosted in the project mm -hmm. so perhaps um, I mean I was uh, wondering when we were doing also uh, the conversation before uh, uh, as a preparation for this session I um, for me, it was a kind of puzzle about uh, what was the interaction like between the people, uh, between the artists uh, in living in exile and uh, um, the people, the artists who rem decided to remain. So, and uh, you also gave some uh, responses to, th to that. Yeah. Well, this was one of our uh, most important parts in the mission that we are uh, neutral politically, because we claim the geographical name just like you said, and it's called Syria Art. This means we wanted to include every artist regarding of their ideological uh, opinion or of their uh, religion or sexuality or anything. So we wanted to focus on an inclusive hub 
and especially in um, Syria at that time, where I was growing up and seeing how divided uh, all scenes are going into. And regardless of my opinion, it was for me, regardless of my personal uh, opinion or my partner's political opinion as well, uh, we wanted to keep a, th a sort of a third line, so to say, where everyone can work together, you know? Uh, the scene is pretty much divided, I would say, uh, into people who are mostly against the regime. Some of the people are with the regime, whether we like it or, or not. Uh, and a lot of people are neutral. And for us, it was very, very important to find common ground in which people can still work together and have a dialogue, which is, of course, very, very hard to, to do. Khaled can also know how hard is it. Uh, especially in this, in this situation, a lot of people don't, work to, don't want to work with a lot of people because of this ideological difference. They don't want to be even identified or put in the same website with other people. I had many, many situations in which artists were pulling back from exhibitions last minute because they found out that one of the young artists had an article at some place where they expressed something which they didn't like, you know? And a lot of people at some point uh, pulled out from our archive, for, so to say, just because they don't want to be in the same uh, website or same social media page, so to say, uh, with other people, which is pretty much problematic. It makes our work very, very hard because uh, this was exactly one of our missions, so to say, to, to keep these people together under this geographical name, uh, not out of nationalistic uh, background, but more of the place is in a war situation and it's already torn apart. So in order to keep the artistic scene a little bit intact, I would say, we wanted always to uh, create exhibitions in which people also work together, for example. But this was really problematic, and especially between artists in exile and artists uh, who are still living inside Syria, I would say. A lot of artists in exile, the majority, wouldn't exhibit in Syria, mm, wouldn't work with artists uh, who are in Syria and have, uh, like I said, a, spe a specific political opinion. So I say division is the least <laughs> uh, uh, um, adjective for this, for the, for the, for the situation. Yeah. And uh, we were also discussing whether the ethnical or um, sectarian differences uh, play a role in uh, these positions, but you said uh, no. Mm -hmm. um, the dividing light is mostly the political stance. Yeah, I would say the division is mostly political. It's not, ba it's not based on ethnical or like Arabs uh, or Kurds or Armenians. No, I think this was never a problem in our work. Uh, also the religious one or the geographical one, so to say. Uh, the problem was solely always politically uh, about being with the regime or against the regime. And in some radical situation, even being neutral was a problem for a lot of people, you know? so. Um, yeah, um, one more question. Um, so your um, one part of the project is uh, living in France and then you are in uh, Berlin. Mm -hmm. And uh, of course, therefore, you have the opportunity to have a comparison between the two contexts. Um, what do you think about, um, um, let's say, um, the community here from uh, Syria uh, in the city of Berlin? I mean, is there a uh, visible um, togetherness among them? Um, uh, is there a concentration in Germany, in the city of Berlin? Uh, and how does it differ from um, the uh, community in France in, t in, the, in relation to the artistic uh, practice? Mm -hmm. Well, I would say there is a certain togetherness. Khalid is a very good example in his work with the, with the space. We will come to this uh, later. Uh, there are many artist groups who are working together, um, but still I would say it's very much bubble-like and also still divided because of the diaspora problem. Because the context is, is diaspora is a lot of people being taken out of their context and thrown all over the map, uh, across Germany and France and uh, all over the, the, the world. So it's very hard for them sometimes to work together because of these distances, because of the, the lack of communication and the lack of uh, the, the, the problem of mobility also for Syrians is a really big one. Like you said, it was very hard for me to, be, to visit all of the exhibitions I curated so far. I have been only in one of the exhibitions 
in Romania in 2017 and the one I did in Berlin. I mean, I'm happy I was able to, <laughs> to visit it here, but uh, all of the other works I was not able to travel. And this is, was the case for a lot of Syrians as well, that they couldn't uh, travel even across Europe or across the, the, the continent. So it was very hard to keep the, um, the, the community together, so to say. Uh, the situation in Berlin, I would say, um, is better than the one in France, in a, in a little bit, because uh, the economical situation in France is different, I would say, and especially for, 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 the, for the artists I know. Um, the diaspora problem probably is uh, the same, I would say. It's not much of a difference, because it's still European context, I would say. Yeah. Okay. Um, so, um, Khalid, uh, you have um, the experience from beforehand. Uh, Humam uh, did the switch uh, in 2017, but uh, you, um, um, I believe, uh, I mean, after graduating uh, the fine arts department in Damascus in 2005, you moved uh, to Denmark and you had your MFA uh, in Odense um, and you graduated from there in 2010, and then you uh, um, became a uh, Meister Schüler uh, in uh, Stedel Schule in Frankfurt, and you gradu graduated the program in 2013. And uh, of course, uh, you have witnessed all this uh, um, period of um, the civil war uh, in Europe, I guess probably you were commuting. Uh, to Syria, or I don't know, or what was the situation? Were you able to, or, or not? Uh, because I mean, uh, your life story is also very interesting, uh, and your artistic practice is also very impressive. Um, I mean, your artworks um, have, uh, um, in a stressed way, um, dealing with a, the traumatic experiences uh, of the civil war, and therefore, those who are interested for it uh, who can visit. Um, uh, Halit's uh, website, and there are also brilliant interviews. Quite, you are quite talkative, and then you give a lot of uh, details about uh, your experiences. Um, but uh, in this session, we wanted to keep concentrated on um, the platforms that you co-founded. Um, um, it is. It has a. Uh, you came to Berlin in 2015. Um, um, you, uh, of course, during probably from the beginning onwards, you were asked about uh, um, an, uh, a knowledge about uh, the Syrian artists from uh, the Western institutions from many parts of the globe. And uh, uh, you, from there, you came to a position of conceiving a project which will be called uh, Syrian Biennial. Uh, a mobile uh, project to uh, bring together uh, Syrian artists who were in the process of dispersing uh, to uh, other uh, um, um, countries. Um, and uh, there were some bureaucratic uh, problems because of the name, as far as I understand. There was uh, obstacles in getting funding because it was using the uh, concept of Syria. Uh, Probably there were uh, conflations whether that was an official position or not. And I think from there you had the idea to transform or you create create another non-profit organization as an umbrella uh, uh, institution which had the name Co-Culture. And uh, in the frame of Co-Culture you also uh, um, open up a um, digital platform uh, of knowledge about Syrian artists who uh, somehow create an interaction between them. Also, a knowledge sharing uh, program uh, was uh, initiated. Syria Cultural Index was the title. And uh, at the end, uh, in difference to Humam's experience, you have uh, this um, quite important experience of uh, working in a physical space. You had uh, uh, the co culture space, which was uh, uh, located in um, Gesundbrunn. Uh, for one year, you were active. I don't know how. What is the situation right now? And perhaps you can also give details about uh, um, your experience with Syrian uh, biennial or um, the space itself. 
Um, yeah, thanks for the... And in the meantime, I thank uh, Halid uh, a lot because uh, um, he stands here quite sleepless. He came here from Copenhagen just in the morning uh, after a long uh, train journey, so um, he's a little bit tired. <laughs> yeah. So, I so bear with me, I would just be slow and uh, yeah, not so focused uh, after 11 hours of a uh, train trip, which I'm questioning if we should save the environment or take the plane next time. <laughs> no. um, yeah, so thanks for the invitation and for the introduction. Um, to give maybe a very short reference and perspective of co-culture and the Syria Cultural Index, um, I will start with this image. Uh, I don't know if you are aware of this phenomena in trees. It's called crown shyness. And crown shyness, it existed in uh, Argentina and in Malaysia. When I was there, I went to the forest and I photographed it. This is just an online photograph now. And basically the trees, uh, it grows until it sends kind of the border of one another and then it stopped growing, right? So it creates this kind of rivers in between. So it starts growing uh, uh, vertically instead of horizontally. And I, it was really fascinated, fascinating to see it. And I think, I, when I think today of the Syrian communities or the Syrian uh, because we are not one community and one nation anymore. We are part of many communities and nations. Um, I think we are very much like the same as the Crown Chinese. We, we are uh, existed in several places, but we are connected by roots. And um, there's also this myth that the trees, the strong trees, you know, grow uh, uh, um, faster to, to kind of gain all the, the food and the sun. Uh, but actually, it's not true. In, the, in ecology, it's, it's, it's true. It, it takes more, more food, but it feeds the, the smallest tree and with the roots, with the fungi system, the mushroom um, roots. So what basically the, the, mush, the, the Syria Cultural Index, it functions as this network, right? So it's the, the ecological, like I think learning from nature and the ecology of nature, we don't need an other models to learn from. Um, so kind of this is, was the very beginning of the Syria Cultural Index give very short introduction and perspective. 2015, as you said, I came to Europe 2008. I kind of gained my network here since I was, I studied in different schools and I already kind of built my studio. And um, many Syrians arrived to Germany, different organization, institutions, uh, galleries, whatever. They want to get in touch with Syrian artists, but they don't know still who they are. So they reach out sometimes like, do you know someone or can you recommend someone for this or that? I ended up recommending people I know or I know of their work, uh, which I felt it's not a fair opportunities for other people that I'm not aware of, especially the last time in Syria, I was in 2011. So everything started with the um, idea of doing a Google poll and just we send it like very basic questionnaire to artists that I know. Uh, your name, your location, do you want us to contact you if we get opportunity? And they send it to other artists and then we ended up with database. That was kind of the basic idea of co-culture. Then the project grew and then we thought there was a fund opportunity. We, we, I was thinking to apply for it and then I didn't meet the deadline. So I ended up with the project proposal without kind of yellow page back then, that was the idea of it. So we just have database of where the Syrian artists today try to connect them. Uh, we didn't meet the deadline, then I just posted the project on Facebook and then it reached out to someone in Ford Foundation and we, I met, we met by coincidence here in a platform called Beirut Berlin, Berlin Beirut. And uh, we shake hands and then decided to fund the project. As you mentioned, there was a problem of receiving the fund because the initiative has the word Syria or the corresponding bank of our bank said has members with Syrian background. So we had to change the whole name of the, of the project uh, that becomes later an organization and it's called co-culture. So I will just give you a very quick run through um, co-culture projects basically. So we have like the main project um, is Syria Cultural Index. Uh, Syria Cultural Index, it's an online platform, aims to map, reconnect, and empower Syrian artists using digital tools. So it shifted kind of a little bit from the original purpose. Um, um, it's a little bit different from Humam, what, what they are doing, but also the same goal, but the, the approach is a little bit different. What we are doing is we are using kind of the, 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 the mass culture, right? So people, they upload their content while what they are doing, they, they are uploading the content of the artist. So we're creating only the platform, you know, like kind of, Facebook or behinds or whatever. Um, and the idea now of the, of the index, it will have different sections uh, that help the artist from 
the, the same kind of reflecting reality from studio to an office to a gallery space to what we call living room. So if I'm entering the dashboard as an artist, I have digital tools that help me in planning my, my production and organizing my time, organizing my, uh, even like how I get inspired. Then we have the second section, which is the office. It, it supports artists by giving examples how to write um, budget breakdown, how to write but, uh, a project proposal because knowledge we don't have, how to write invoices by giving them tutorial uh, material. Uh, the third one will be the, the gallery. This is where we're starting now. The gallery basically is where they up upload their work. And the last section is the, the, the living room. The living room is more personal information about the artist. We are also planning in the future not to have kind of muted navigation, but you navigate with an avatar. So even everyone visiting the platform, they create their like, small avatar and they enter the website. So you can see if there's someone visiting your gallery or ro your room and you get notified and then you can talk to them. Or if by coincidence me and you visiting the same Artwork, we can talk, we can turn it on and like uh, or off the sound, etc., etc. So it's kind of shifted it, its purpose. But the idea is to give the artist platform where they can present themselves the way they want in a professional way, because most of the artists, something I noticed as well, because I give workshop at the art university as well at the Odeka specifically for artists with exile background. Um, that most of them, when you ask them, like, okay, show me your work, most of them they turn to Facebook or Instagram and log in and, you know, they don't remember the password. So and it's not the professional way of presenting their work. So we thought in this case it will become a reference where they can have their own website, build their own website where it becomes central. Basically thinking of since Syria was globalized as a, as a, as a conflict, we thought like why not to think big, to think the size of, of the globe because we are all over the world. So why not to build a digital uh, space, kind of parallel republic, w for working almost as what should have the Ministry of Culture been doing, right? Like scanning, knowing the artist, what their location. In this case, with this project, we will end it up with um, um, database that will become analytical tools. So we'll know how many artists living where, their gender, their profession, and then any third party who want to, uh, if you are a researcher, if you are a curator, if you are uh, governments, whatever, you can know, for example, if there's um, not enough uh, female artists working in video art in Malmo, for example, then, you know, based on statistics. So you can start designing program based on statistic, not based on expectation. And we were, like, the whole project, because it went through, we were a little bit delayed delivering the project because it grew uh, quite a lot. It grew, like, the, the index is not our main project. It's our main project, but it's not our only project. There was many projects. Um, we did a few the last few years. So we were thinking of different dire direction, now thinking of Web3, thinking of the uh, metaverse, thinking of many things that and the, the NFT and the, the, the blockchain, etc. But at the moment, we are working on the iteration where we were just um, uh, finishing the gallery part, and we will like delay the second, not delay, but we will just release one part after another, after examining the project. Um, based on the index, basically, we will know who is living where, doing what, and that will lead us to plan the second project, which is the Syrian Pinale. As you said, it's a mobile Pinale that would follow the refugee routes, kind of reconnecting the community, because we are, as I mentioned, many communities has different needs living in different places. And uh, the wish is actually to do a Pinale that will start in Lebanon and then move maybe to, to, to uh, Turkey. It's kind of what, you know, how the refugee uh, moved. And from there to Balkan roads, to Central Europe, elsewhere. Um, since uh, like all kind of our work is, is based on connectivity and collectivity, so also the creation of the of the penale is for me it's quite interesting. So I wrote a statement what the penale is. We invited a curator called Nadim Saman. He's the digital curator at Cafe. He reflected on the, the statement with uh, another text. Then we sent this text to many. Um, uh, cultural uh, organization or cultural uh, leaders or uh, curators or Pinale people asking them to criticize the Pinale before even making it, right? So we have 20 contributions from different people telling us why we should or we shouldn't make the Pinale. Like, is it important to do a Pinale where the country is falling apart, etc., etc.? And then the second part was a trip to uh, Beirut, to Istanbul, and to Berlin, and to uh, just, she, just to, to understand the 
geopolitical environment. If, if, if for example, Istanbul, would they allow or welcome a penale, Syrian penale, or how, how Istanbul penale would feel about it? Do they feel like we are competing with them, or is it like, you know, like, so we wanted to understand, basically. We didn't get, I didn't get the visa to go there. Nadim went to Istanbul. Um, and then the explosion happened in Lebanon, so we didn't both uh, went to Lebanon. But Istanbul was very welcoming, and many, many organizations actually showed their support. Same thing in Berlin. We were thinking of model where we uh, either do the penale uh, at the same time, parallel, so it has more attention, or taking over penale. So we take over Berlin penale, and we call it one edition Syrian penale as a statement as well of understanding that we are the new citizens. Like now in Germany, we ha there's seven... I'm not sure about the number, but 500 to 700,000 uh, Syrians that will become the new Syrian Germans, right? So, so also kind of reflecting this reality that we will do the Syrian penale. I will finish in like one minute, sorry, to, to speak a lot. And um, this, the third project, um, yeah, as, as you mentioned, we have a space. We had actually, we just um, uh, gave it up end of uh, the last year. We have a space in, in, in um, in Wedding, in Gozenbrunnen, a very beautiful building designed by Brandon Huber and uh, called Lo Lobeplock, where we've done a lot of exhibition and community meetings, kind of trying to connect the community here in Berlin, the artistic community. Um, yeah, anyway, so, and yeah, th we've done a lot of, like, a different other project as well, so I will not maybe get into it, but that's kind of that, that the main idea of co-culture and the index and what was behind it. Um, but... Uh in relation with the space, uh, co-culture space, um, um, how it will uh, evolve uh, in the coming period? Uh. Um, yeah, so the whole kind of, yeah, it's a, it's a little bit, uh, I will not get so much in detail, but the whole thing kind of grow in, a, in a, an interesting, crazy way. So we didn't have, actually we didn't have fund to rent space. We have fund to rent small studio. So we came together, my studio, Co-Culture, and uh, my business partner called Benjamin Klato. He's a web developer, and he's helping me with also building the, the, the index. And we thought, why not to rent the space, and we can rent it out commercially, and then we can pay the rent back and support our cultural events. So that was kind of the model. And so we managed to get the space through that, basically, otherwise we wouldn't have been able to. Then Corona hit, and kind of the whole plan uh, financially didn't work out exactly as planned. Uh, so we had to give up the space because also it was a lot of pressure because we still like small uh, cultural organization that just founded itself a few years ago. So we're still not in the capacity of running a space and running the penale and running that. So it was a, quite a lot and I have my artistic practice that I don't want to give up as well. For me, speaking of which, co-culture is art project even though it's in a form of cultural organization and it has its own legal entity as a fine, but for me it's just another project like a painting or sculpture or, yeah. Um, so for now, actually, we are taking a break from the space because we needed it. Uh, I think it was a little bit, uh, especially with Corona, in a personal level as well, psychologically, I think it was a little bit too much. Uh, so we decided to, for now, not to, to work on a space or get a new space, but focus on finishing the index, which will, what we are doing. It will be done in a few months, hopefully in the summer will be the release of it. Mm -hmm. um, um, I have another question, um, which I will uh, depart from um, defining the twist exhibition. So uh, if it will be not a mistake, I guess, uh, to relate the Twister project to the, um, a series of exhibitions that were held uh, with the initiation of Apartment Project, um, which became in the last couple of years um, the hub of um, artists from Turkey, uh, which is defined as the new wave. Um, and uh, um, so um, also in Engebeka, there was a CIS project, um, which was, uh, which was uh, here in um, two years ago, uh, I believe, um, but there are also some side uh, um, exhibitions in the apartment project or previously in Istanbul. Um, but this was like concentrated on people from Turkey, and this twist exhibition is like an attempt to conceive it in a larger frame, rather than uh, let's say national borders or uh, like let's say specific cities uh, from Turkey. There was this attempt uh, to bring up a comparative analysis because 
we basically know that there are people who share similar experiences. Um, and uh, so we had um, about this issue a uh, prior conversation with Humam, um, uh, but I wanna ask you directly because you have a more direct experience on it. Um, of course, um, um, being from Syria, um, can be defined as a national identity, but there is also the uh, potentiality uh, that is uh, opening the country to a larger region through language. Um, and um, uh, so um, there have been recently, of course, uh, um, political upheavals uh, in Egypt. There have been things going on in Iraq and recently Lebanese experiences getting also quite complicated and there are similar kind of uh, exoduses um, from these countries. So I know that you have already um, collaborations with artists from other uh, Arab speaking countries. So how you um, map out this uh, contact uh, with the Arab speaking world or in your, some of your projects you um, define um, your um, addressed uh, uh, collaborators not through uh, Syrian nationality, but through a more generalized uh, conception of uh, people or artists in exile, or even uh, uh, people who or artists uh, who come from underrepresented communities. So, how do you combine these two things together? Uh, yeah, I funny enough, like everything is called Syria Cultural Index, Syrian Penale, Syria blah blah blah. But I really don't believe in political identities in general, like because, for example, when we say Syrian, basically we are uh, defending uh, a colonization plan of Sykes Pico agreement where they decided now, like they literally, like British and uh, 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 French guy, they decided that I'm Syrian, right? Which doesn't make sense if you think of decolonization going back in history. So I think the region, if you look at it also from a geographical ethnic perspective, it, the, the mapping how in the political identity is quite um, ironic. Um, because there's this famous story, I don't know if you know it, like in the north of Syria, because it's divided in, in um, uh, close to Dara, there's like a desert, and the, the line, the border is like going really straight, and only one part of it, and it's a desert area, and there's no people living as well, so it's like go, you know, not straight line. And the story, I don't know if it's true or not, but it reflects, I think, how they did it. That they, when they're dividing the map, the guy sneezed, so his hand shaked, and this is, you know, and they just left it as it is. Which kind of, I wouldn't actually be surprised how they divided the whole Arab region, not only like the how they divided the world. Um, but we decided to go for now with the, with the political division that already existed for several reasons. Uh, first of all, like with the Syrian Penale, it's very easy. Like if I tell you now we are initiating Syrian Penale, it's clearly like in your head, I communicated the project. If I'm telling you we want to do project that it's similar to Penale, but not, it's about Syrians, but not, you know, so it will become, so for now it will be called Syrian Penale. In the future, definitely we, it might not, I don't know. Uh, Syria Cultural Index, it will not remain Syria Cultural Index. We have this idea of let's dream big and start small. The idea, hopefully, if the platform uh, uh, managed to be successful, uh, to open it to other nations that has the same needs. So, so it will be, um, uh, let's call it index now, index slash Syria slash Libya slash Yemen slash uh, Palestine, because many nations have the same needs. And maybe one day we can open it even beyond uh, the country in the conflict uh, areas or conflict zones. And uh, which also will still kind of be based on the national identity for one specific reason, which is connected to the fund opportunities, right? Because many, many funds, as we know, it's either based on your nationality or your location. So, if, and of course, like many other factors as well. But also the, the fact that if, like, for example, there's fund for Syrian artists in, Bar in Germany or Syrian artists in, or Syrian artists in Jordanian artists or whatever. So we have to go with this kind of political division and reflect how the, the word is, is rooted today in this kind of division between nations. Um, but we will, like the whole thing kind of for now is, um, it's, a, it's a 
project under development. It's not like set, you know, like the whole co-culture and its project. It's kind of evolving actually through many conversations, through panel discussions, through reflection from people. I kind of plan things. Then someone told me in one day, you should do or you shouldn't or think of this. And then I kind of change the plan. So it's a evolving project. And that's why I called it an art project more than cultural organization in this sense. Uh, it's pretty much interesting that uh, we have similar projects in the in the bigger purpose, I would say, and that they grew at the same time and reached this point because we were also thinking about changing our name many times uh, after doing all of the exhibitions internationally in Canada, Romania, the UK, the US, uh, even South Korea. We built this network of artists and other curators and uh, institutes and museums. And last year we started also doing projects reaching beyond our name as a Syria art, you know? So we, we did our first international project, which included 180 artists. It was a male art project, and only three of them were Syrian. And that's where we started realizing we can actually really grow beyond this uh, frame. We should use it where it's necessary, exactly like Khaled said, where we have to uh, promote the work of, of people within this geography where it fits, but after being a refugee in, uh, in Europe and being here since five years, we recognize that the sense of identity within a geographical, uh, because, of geography, because of geography, I would say, uh, it gets lost in a, in a way and it gets unnecessary. You don't feel connected only to people of this uh, uh, geography. You get connected to the rest of the world and that's where you realize uh, sticking to one nationality or sticking to a very binary way of, of uh, thought where everything is always divided and labeled and uh, is always like into these little uh, dots. I think it's, yeah. it's time for everyone to, to kind of uh, get beyond this uh, division. Yeah. I think maybe also it reflects where we are today after seven yeah. years if we want to take like 2015 as a date where many Syrians arrive because also our kind of subtleness and the new communities where we existed and building our network and getting to know people and start also being reflected I think in our work like the male exhibition you did for example. Yeah. Um, well, I have more questions, but uh, I already knew that uh, we were uh, having limited time uh, um, before getting into our second session. So we uh, thought of having a 10 minutes uh, um, Q&A session with the audience. Um, so um, for Emre and Melich, I will also say, so if we uh, stop earlier, we can have five minutes break uh, before uh, Amina's uh, film. Um, but um, any question from the audience? We have 10 minutes or a little bit less. Um, it, uh, I, I will ask to Halit. Halit, um, from all you were saying, actually you were talking so fast, so I didn't catch everything, but um, I just want to understand, this co-culture is the part of your project, so you name it, actually not a co-culture, is not a project space, but it's the project of the Halit. Um, in this project, you're mainly uh, working with the Syrian artists and um, so you have a, a team or you just take all the decisions yourself or and also um, the third question is what's the aim of the project okay you want to do uh, the Syrian Biennale and also the um, sorry I don't read it um, another project as well so which one is come first and how you how you will succeed it is to Two large projects, actually. Yes. Um, yeah, thanks for the question. So first of all, as I mentioned, the Syria Cultural Index came first. It evolved to co-culture as a fine because 
the, the fund was rejected, sent from the state, and they rejected that corresponding bank for bank, send it back, because the word Syria was existed, so we changed it to co-culture. So, and then the idea was to have a project co -co called co-culture, has a project called Syria Cultural Index. Then we found the space, and then we rented the space through the model I, I mentioned, and then it becomes another project of co-culture. And then, uh, the, then I got actually funded personally, but I, I, I um, uh, um, uh, uh, directed to co-culture from European Cultural Foundation for research phase of the Syrian Pinale as, a, as, an, as an idea, as a concept. And then uh, through that, we ended up having cultural organization that has legal, it's a legal entity, which, uh, which means that we, can al we are allowed to apply for fund, we are apply, allowed to ha have cooperation. So we start cooperation with many, many organization around the world and also in Berlin. Uh, we are a team of people. The, the team was, it's mainly freelancers and it's uh, sizable, right? So every time we have like, once we have like, 12 or 14 people, I can't even remember how many. And uh, once we have only, th we were only three. So it depends on the intensity of the project and the fund we got, because we are a fund-driven organization. We apply for fund, we get the fund, we hire people, we deliver the, the project, we f deliver the fund report and uh, the, the, the narrative report, and then the freelancers, they work with us, but they don't work with us anymore. The idea, the, 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 the decision-making at the moment it's unfortunately me, because still we are in a, not in a position that we can hire so many people. Uh, the idea we would love to actually, for so many reasons, also I really get tired, I w not only the reason, but also reflecting at a male-led uh, organization. I would love to share my position with a female fellow, like preferably from the Syria or speaking Arabic, but not necessary as well. So it's the organization will be led equally by by male and female or others. And, um, and the, the plan, which we didn't achieve it yet, is to have uh, board members. So the board members will decide and they will like, so basically creating the whole infrastructure of organization. Also, since it's fine, we want the, 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 the assembly, everyone to become of the assembly member, every artist. And this is what we are doing with the index. Your profile is your share basically. So which means that the moment you create a profile as an artist, you have a vote. You can kick me out if the community decide it's not, we don't want Khaled to run the project, we want someone else. So we kind of trying to think of in a wilder sense, practicing democracy and practicing kind of different model of NJBK, but a little bit similar to it as well. A second question. We have one more time space for another question. So uh, we, as I, as I said, it's, it's changeable over uh -huh. time. I mean this uh, in terms. So this is not me it's actually, this is you, okay. No, no, it's not me. It's, I have amazing people working. I wouldn't have been done doing like uh, half of what I've done no, without, actually, the, uh, without the support of the team. So I have a, uh, we have a team of people from different uh, nationality, different generation, different backgrounds. So if no question, I will ask again, um, who is there? And yeah, my question is about how it works with the artists. So for example, if I'm an Syrian artist or the artist from different country, I can just go to your website and just open my profile, although there is some kind of process between this opening and creating profile. Uh, I guess you mean with the Syria Cultural Index, right? Yes. Yeah. Um, so the project will be released in a few months. Uh, we thought a lot about it, also the question of inclusivity and like first of all, we have a question. We have a big questions actually. F two questions. First, who's Syrian? Like, if I'm identifying myself as Syrian, but I don't have Syrian passport, am I Syrian or not? The second question is who's an artist, right? Like so, and then which criteria do we use 
to allow you to have a profile and, and the face and the and the Siri cultural index or not. So we came up with solutions. Uh, I think it's uh, to, uh, after a lot of like uh, of thinking about it. So Syrians, whoever they identify themselves as Syrians or have Syrian roots, but of course German person who would like to identify them uh, themselves as Syrians, for them even it's not beneficial to have because they will not meet the criteria of any opportunity that will arrive to the platform. Um, uh, and also we know the community, like every know, every, uh, everyone know everyone, even like it's a big nation, but we still know each other in the art uh, and cultural field. And this question of who is an artist, we are using some uh, like a different model. So basically, either you should have graduated from art school or art, art institution, uh, you should have an art history that you, you know, like you, if you didn't graduate, but you have some exhibitions. Uh, if you can prove that you made an income, like similar to Kaska, that you didn't uh, you have an income with selling an artwork, so you are professionally also working as an artist, because what we want to avoid, even though we would love everyone to become an artist and to have inclusive e existence, but we want to avoid also what I called Sunday artists, you know, like people who were just like, you know, spending, which is super fine, you might be also professional, artists and just working on Sundays, don't get me wrong, but you know what I mean, like the people who just like draw sometimes as a hobby. Uh, because we want to we want to have this kind of uh, reflection on the cultural scene. So, so that's another, and then we thought, what if someone just graduated, never had an exhibition and they're brilliant. So what they can do, they can tag three people from the platform and the people decide if this person is an artist or not. So we give the power to the community to decide, so it's not us including or excluding people, but the community kind of decide. Okay, thank you. Um, the last question is mine, to Humam. Um, so you were only 20 when you initiated the Siri Art project, um, so it has been 10 years so far. Um, and uh, in our prior conversation, you also hinted at that uh, it is somehow a project in transition. So, oh, and uh, you have been collaborating with two different uh, colleagues. Um, so will there be a change in the structure or format or how to act to which direction it will evolve to? Well, we are trying also to uh, make a new uh, Verein or association here in Germany. We faced the same problems like Khaled did in France. Uh, having the name Syria blocked us from getting funds all over France and even in uh, online platforms. Uh, our bank refuses uh, to get any money also on uh, uh, received from any place. Every time we get uh, a 10 euros donation, we get called to be asked if uh, that's going to be used uh, for terror support. Uh, even shown like our in one year, we had only 1,000 euros, which is not enough to, I don't know if it's even enough to buy one weapon in Syria or not, but still they wanted us to sign formal, uh, like all of the uh, uh, ne like necessary uh, uh, formulas to prove and uh, secure that we are not going to use that in any terror uh, uh, support. So this created for us a lot of uh, traumatic experience, I would say, by having uh, the name of this geography uh, in our artistic uh, practice. Uh, in addition, of course, to what, I, what we just discussed before about uh, growing outside of this uh, identity that we thought uh, I mean, 10 years ago, I identified myself only as a Syrian. I was living in that geography and I saw the world uh, from that perspective. Uh, right now, I don't. And my partners also who work in this uh, project, they also don't. And that's why we wanted to register this new uh, thing. But the structure is still a non-profit because this is what we believe in, in a, in a way. Uh, I have a different um, project parallel to this, which about to be stopped, which what you talked about is the Cyrus Online Gallery. I created this in 2012 uh, to help younger artists sell their artworks, which is the only profit uh, uh, project we did. Uh, this is about to stop, but we are we want to uh, register something here in Germany. Yeah. Yeah. Registered in, why are you registered in France, not in Germany? Uh, because back then, in 2015, I was still in Damascus, and Khaled, uh, who we, we wanted to do this uh, together. I was living in Nice, in France, and it didn't make sense to register in Damascus. I think you know why. <laughs> so uh, that's why. Oh. Okay, thank you.
Khalid Baraka and uh, Humam Al Salim. Um, I hope we will uh, encounter in different opportunities and in different projects again. And the uh, next uh, session uh, will be hosted by Shirin uh, mm -hmm. with uh, the contribution participation of Amina Maher. And uh, I think we should give a five minutes break and then start with the uh, screening of Amina's uh, film. Thank you. <laughs> Hello everyone, welcome to the second part of our panel. Um, I'm just going to do a quick introduction before we uh, watch a short documentary. Um, in the second part, uh, we will be seeing Amina Maher's uh, documentary, Letter to My Mother. It's 19 minutes. Um, the film will be followed with a discussion with Amina regarding both the film as well as her uh, experiences uh, here uh, in Berlin. Uh, Amina has been here since 2017. Um, and uh, yeah, she's been living here in 2017. Um, in recent years, Berlin has been actually a destination or let's say a key host for uh, LGBTQI plus individuals um, who are particularly uh, escaping uh, authoritarian regimes uh, that targets or censor um, uh, who censor them. Uh, and however, the day-to-day -day experience here is not uh, without uh, its failings. So homophobia and transphobia, unfortunately, are daily realities. So uh, we will kind of, I guess, have a conversation about uh, um, this. Um, yeah, so without further ado, let's start with the film and yes, then... Yes, uh, I don't know why I came here without you. I mean, <laughs> I mean like I thought we directly go to the conversation. I mean, like I just forgot it for a while, but it's absolutely fine. You saw me, um, I'm here, yeah. and I hope that you enjoy the film. Thank you. time. Um, so just quickly, um, I realize I forgot to present Amina um, in the introduction. Um, I only mentioned that she's been uh, living here in Berlin since 2017. Um, I'm but uh, December 2017. December 2017. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Um, end of 2017. Um, Amina is, well, she's a filmmaker. Um, she studied film uh, completed her BA in Malaysia, and she's currently doing an MA at the Film University Babesbach Conrad Wolf, um, which is where I, well, it's not where I know you from, but it's a good coincidence. Um, and her films essentially explore the themes of gender and identity in relation to power and violence. And her kind of first uh, filmic experience was Abbas Kiyorosami's 10, which um, uh, we saw today also. Uh, in the film, and um, uh, you know, in the, and in the film where she she portrays her real life relationship with her mother, uh, Mania Akbari, who's also a filmmaker um, in her own right. Um, and I guess uh, to begin this conversation, uh, both uh, about the film and uh, about um, your experiences here in Berlin, um, perhaps we could just um, I could ask you, you know, how. What, at what point did you kind of decide to turn uh, your experience um, into a film? So was there like kind of a breaking point where you decided that, you know, you needed to face uh, your trauma and break your silence? And, um, you know, and why choose the filmic method to address your mom and confess to her? Um, 
Thank you for this question. I guess it's an important one. Um, when all the doors are kind of closed to fight for justice, to you know, like to reveal the truth, I guess perhaps sometimes art can help. You know, like it was around like I don't know exact time, but five six years ago when I talked in my family, I didn't address how and in which shape it happened, but I talk about this childhood experiences and. Um, but I mean, like, um, they didn't accept. I mean, of course, the rapist and also, like, part of family, you know? So I was kind of like, after I broke my silence, it became more often difficult for me to live with it, you know, in a way. So then, from that time, it was kind of like, I mean, I was, I started my filmmaking practices kind of in a school, you know? I had a small camera of filming friends at a school and university. But it was a time kind of that um, filmmaking was becoming really serious for me. And at that time I was thinking, okay, perhaps I should create a movie about this story. And I was seeing some images and it was a difficult time because at the, time, at the same time I was suffering addiction, I was like, Two periods of time in my life, I was addicted to tramadol. Uh, the first period was between the age of 13 to 18, and the second was between the age of 21 to 26. So kind of like it's now four years that I'm alive, you know. But uh, I, I guess the trauma and me, we played like a ping pong, you know. I got a little bit power to think of a story, to think of an idea, and then like uh, the idea uh, like gave me back uh, more, you know, like motivation to uh, move on. So it was, yeah, this is how it began, but it was a long process because a lot of, as you can see, we have different imagery and a lot of parts were filmed, like a part with therapist or like, as you said, the archive of 10, mm -hmm. which is documentary. And that's why I brought it to the context of documentary because I didn't know when the camera was on recording me in that movie. And uh, yeah, so it took like something like five years, six years, but kind of like this, it was a means for survival in a way, it was therapeutic and um, yeah, I guess from the first time that I thought about creating the film, kind of I had some sort of, you know, security about this, this must be told and this yeah. must be made. But as time passed more, I made, I became more sure because the society, the, you know, um, which, I mean, it has multiple layers. I cannot just address to family as an institution, as a structure and patriarchy, but also it's this normativity, you know, and binary, a lot of other things together. The system of oppression as a general was not letting me to express it and to articulate this protest. But kind of like, um, yeah, I mean, uh, once it was made, I, I mean, when, in the middle of the process, I was kind of sure that this is the way perhaps to revise injustices and to fight for the truth and somehow also to encourage others to break their silences to know which society we live in. Yeah, um, I mean, you, you mentioned a couple of things that I, I'd like to revisit uh, in a bit, especially in regards to you know, the themes and uh, the different layers and the filmic material that you use. But the first thing I, I, I'd like to just quickly mention is this the, the film 10 uh, by Ayas Kiorostami. This is a film, I mean, I'm sure most of you are aware that was, you know, nominated for a Palme d'Or and it won several awards in 2002. Ayas Kiorostami is, uh, you know, a well-known uh, kind of filmmaker who celebrated, you know, one of those auteurs that, uh, you know, uh, the film uh, industry likes to celebrate. And, you know, we see the film 10 here completely kind of, as audiences at least, recast and re contextualize in a new light with the, the kind of this background story of this, you know, little child that, you know, we got to know uh, through the film, but, you know, completely in, in a new light now that we know what was happening um, to, uh, to you at the time. So was this something that you were aware of in terms of, uh, you know, recasting this supposed canonical text um, as well as, as your story, because this is how uh, the world, I guess, got to know you um, and your relationship with your mother. So was this something that you were also trying to kind of, um, you know, kind of uh, re reframe in the light of, of the truth? Um, always to take a decision to include something in the movie, for me, it needs to have, like, 
at least three, f uh, you know, like a plenty of reasons or elements should work together that convince me to have something in a movie. And a part about the movie 10, it was the true life of my mother and me. And it was like, um, I didn't know the camera was on, as I said, so I'm talking about my childhood in this movie. I'm addressing how over four years I was raped by a family. I mean, like a family member raped me. I have to also take care of the vocabulary, it's important. But I mean, like, um, so it was important to see. It's a letter to the mother. It was a very valuable archive to use it in this movie to show how was the relationship of the mother and the child at the time. And um, also, it was kind of like, um, you see the situation of woman, as my mother says in the car, like, woman can't get divorced and you have the hijab. And I guess with this topic of rape culture and patriarchy, I would say they match together. And then also I brought it to the context of the documentary because um, the film, that's, that's why I brought it because like, uh, you know, the film was my private moments with my mother. And nothing could be better for me to refer to as those footages. And also later in the movie, when we see the shots of Tehran, I will say, uh, Kerosami Vaughn said that um, there are a lot of tents happening every day in in the in Tehran and or in the streets, not the Tehran, but in the streets, because of course this is a global issue. But um, then I say that there are a lot of children getting raped every day, you know. In the so kind of because I guess the film has a it narrates to the mother as a it doesn't want to do analyzes that I know everything, you know. It's just and talks to the mother as a child very s in a very simple way. So it has this anarchy approach and um, kind of like with the story of 10, it was abusive for me and my mother and because at the time Kiarostami was a very well established filmmaker as you mentioned already, he had a palmador and um, yes, we are still fighting in different ways for this process and it's ongo an ongoing. But uh, yes, I mean, he sold the world, the documentary, I mean, my parts and also other protagonists, they were like all documentary as a fiction movie. And so uh, like how the f language of the film is metaphorical and symbolic, like a shaving, you know, and like, yeah. Um, I guess here also I was hitting to this subject that these moments were real. This was our real life, as I say it clearly in the movie. And um, because the whole movie is articulating a protest, you know? Mm -hmm. It's like, uh, well, usually we have in this family structure, in normativity, when we want to talk about parents, we are very con uh, conservative in a way, you know? Like a mother and father, you know? Uh, we are in this. So the movie is not doing that, you know? The movie is, I guess, um, so it was fitting to also like, as a new generation kind of like, and as you said, filmmaker and this abuse also was there and this was all private life kind of to see how this child is behaving with the mother and what is the situation of the past and now this body of this child is getting shaved and it's a grown up body and the film ends with the hairs on the bathtub you know so with this childhood could create a good contrast you could feel it better that mm -hmm. who was this child that I am talking about so it was very valuable to use it and it had a lot of reasons but as I said also, like, I guess I'm hitting to this subject that um, like, you're an author or whatever, but you cannot see a lot of things that uh, male gays cannot see in such a system or mm -hmm. might not see in such a system. Mm -hmm. But you, so you use the, this, this tool, the, the autoethnography, right, which is, you know, this, and you mentioned earlier that also we saw in the film that there are, you know, who knows how many multiple tens happening every day across the world. So through your autoethnography, you kind of tie your personal story to more kind of bigger, um, you know, problems in relation to culture, so these cultural taboos. And it's very important to, to speak out, especially about rape culture, where, you know, people essentially, or, you know, 
turn a, a blind eye to these realities because they're so kind of, you know, they're so taboo that it's, you know, it's, it's better not to talk about it and ignore and hope we can move on. So, you know, breaking the silence of these grand na narratives that impose this type of power relation and, um, you know, and force you to kind of shut down is, is is one aspect, but um, so you, but there's also this duality because you're both kind of the su you're the subject of your film, and um, you know you're the director. So how does that duality work in terms of the healing process that was also very much uh, part of 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 the film? Um, yes, uh, I mean it's um, it's very difficult to direct a movie and be in front of the camera. But I would say that when one makes an ethnographic film, uh, it's very important to have a pain to address something. You know, like if I go in front of my camera and think of how beautiful I am and how, you know, then, you know, as an ethnographer, you know, so it's bravery and be being witness is really important and, um, and confession uh, also. So you have to, yeah. you have to, you know, like uh, this is my, this is the perspective that I will. This is my approach. I don't want to uh, uh, generalize for everybody and everything, but I would say that, um, yeah, he, somehow how I look at the camera after I, had, you know, like after we see this shaving and my body is fully shaved, I look at the camera, and I. Basically, I look at the audience. I look at to your eyes, and I tell you that for over four years I was raped. Like, um, the seer becomes a scene. You kind of have a better empathy with this. You kind of, you know, it's the power of the images. It's the power of filmmaking, I would say. You kind of, like, think of your own experiences. So it's like mirroring you. That's, you know, so. And I would say that why it's difficult is because when I want to create a scene, um, I'm working with my protagonist, making them ready to go deep to the conversation or to be able to rebuild something of a pain or a memory or something, then I have to really be real. I cannot just say, okay, I am in front of the camera. This is beautiful. Let's sh no, I should feel something there. And then from another side, I also should see what is frame, what is, you know, so it's impossible with assistant or anybody to like uh, make this, po you know, like therefore, um, yeah. I guess also the process of how you create your movie and how you see, you know, things is influencing the result. They are not separated. Mm -hmm. And um, yes, this idea of mirroring yourself as a self-reflexive experimental movie we are watching, I thought, uh, yeah, so it's important to, to, yeah, to try to address things that others are ashamed to talk about it. If I am in front of the camera filming myself, at least, you know, I should have a courage for something that can change cultural or social changes. You know, uh, can, yeah, socially or culturally can mean something. Let's put it in this way. So I would say, um, yeah, this is, this is how I uh, approach to ethnography. And just as a quick, um, just from what you said lastly, how has, how has the film been, I mean, received in terms of, did it, did you have people reach out to you? Did it build kind of these networks of, um, you know, solidarity amongst survivors? Was this, you know, because this is also, as you're saying, you know, breaking the silence and, you know, kind of, uh, you know, calling out rape culture, like, did it create this um, uh, reaction? Uh, and I don't know, unfortunately or fortunately, yes. Because um, like um, the film, luckily, not only that was, um, I mean, yeah, it was more than in more than 50 countries, you know, globally was a screen, but I would say that like, um, it was not a screening, but it was also like kind of, um, I talked about also this experience in TV after the screening of the film, you know what I mean? And I guess um, it caused a lot of people luckily to know the movie. A lot of people to ask me, I mean like still, I, re I mean now there is a Vimo but a lot of Iranians cannot watch it. So kind of, why I say unfortunately or fortunately it became, uh, seen a lot, the f unfortunately I say because at the same time it took, it ate my 
time up. Filmmakers know these festivals kill your time from one side, but also then there were this society asking, because I got involved in the situation of a lot of survivor of rapes. And I broke my silence in TV, and it was a Me Too movement of Iran, so like kind of more people were breaking their silences about their experiences. And um, yeah, so kind of like I collaborated also with Me Too a couple of times, um, and I know them, and I got this movie also caused me somehow to know more Iranian activists, to, more, to know more Iranian politicians, and, um, and kind of like, I mean, Me Too, I have to say Iranian Me Too movement is doing uniquely great. Like less than a month ago, the more than 300 women filmmakers published a statement together. And also they are living with Turkai. Uh, they are working together with Turkai. It's a good collaboration. And it was the first time in the history that they bravely opened up about their experiences of rape, even saying the word, you know, in TV, Iranian TV, you know. So it's like, a, I've, since two, three years, I mean, in 2019, like, my movie was shown a little bit before Iranian Me Too movement, when it started, but when it started until now, because the premiere of the film was from Castle Dogfest in 36 Castle Dogfest in Germany in November 2019. But then, when it started until now, I would say, like, it could change a lot. It could address a lot about like how the political system oppresses, you know, be people based on their gender, gender identity and how toxic masculinity works, and what are the unspoken uh, stories about sexual violence in general. And I, uh, I'm happy that I could be part of it. I learned a lot. I mean, I, or I l unlearned a lot. Better to say, I don't like to learn, as I guess my ma my film also is like you know. So, but. Um, I hope so, I hope to unlearn, not learn. But um, at the same time, unfortunately, because I experienced a lot of violence in social media and TV, like my interview with Iran International about my own experiences of rape was watched more than 100 times, and there were times that people like insulting me all the time, you know, like perhaps thousands of comments about my hairs or about my gender identity or about like I look like a monkey or if I'm a woman or a man or it was my fault that I was raped but how rape can happen for four years, even these kind of things, if you, so it means you liked it. You know, like, um, and then also the court uh, of, uh, with the family, and still we are dealing with the family situation. I have to say, the film is out three years, and uh, still, <laughs> yeah, so kind of like as a queer child, I don't have a family, you know, my family is somewhere else, and I guess there is a good reason sometimes for that, you know. But um, yeah, so it was, um, yeah, so it has, in, like how the therapist, we have the talk together, and I wish that uh, he was not a guy, I mean, <laughs> to be honest with him. It was documented at the time, and uh, anyway. But uh, how we are talking together, and he says about uh, nothing is black and white, and I guess this uh, being seen also was not really black and white. It had some traumatizing situations and stressful situations and thinking of rape all the time and talking about it, you know, it's not easy also. Uh, but also I unlearned a lot or I got to know myself and the society better and who I am really better, so I'm happy. Um, I just, from what I understand, so your, your activism is still very much um, in line with Iran, so you're active in the Me Too movement there. As you were saying, you've recently been on Iranian uh, satellites, on a broadcast for Ita uh, on of Iranian satellite broadcast to talk about the Me Too movement. So your activism is very much in line with what is happening over there. But but you've been here, you've been a refugee in Berlin, particular uh, in Berlin. I mean, I know your journey starts way before Berlin, so you left kind of Iran uh, 10 years ago, you know, you went to Malaysia, you passed by Dubai, and you know you came here, um, and you know you you've been a refugee here since 2017. And I guess like um, just thinking about you know the context that I know, the the Turkish con the context of where I'm from, Turkey, um, a lot of LGBTQI plus individuals are just are, are especially in the last couple of years have been you know particularly targeted by um, the the government and the officials of the government whether they're the religious uh, officials or the political officials and 
Um, and, and, and this has rendered kind of the day-to-day -day reality very dangerous and uh, a lot of uh, individuals within the LGBTQI uh, community are just leaving, you know, leaving regardless, uh, just to be able to, to, to survive essentially without necessarily having a plan or whatever. And, and Berlin happens to be uh, one of those destinations which is, uh, you know, has been kind of uh, idealized or uh, imagined and represented um, in a way that seems to be kind of like a, a haven uh, for queer people. Um, but yet, you know, being here, you know, doesn't mean, uh, you know, that the daily reality um, is so, you know, you face homophobia, you face transphobia. Uh, so what, I guess, uh, my question would be, if what was your expected reality? What was your expectation and how has um, your reality here kind of uh, been experienced since uh, coming here? Um, thank you. I would like, before I answer it, I would like to give a little bit of background because like I talk about addiction and so on. But like, um, yes, I came to Berlin like in 2018 actually because first as a refugee I was assigned in Brandenburg in the Eisenhüttenstadt and I was not in an LGBTQI camp because at the time I was in a cis-normative relationship. So I was not out yet. But um, yeah, it's, there are a lot of like cliches about Berlin that is the paradise of queer people. I don't think that's that much right, to be honest. But I guess we are living in the world that the society is not ready for us. As a trans person, I mean like, now I am three years out. As you can see, I don't have passing, you know, I don't have boobs and so on. So I have to deal every day with um, this. I have to struggle every day from Eshpeti to clinic to uh, job center to university. Hermaher, Hermaher, I nightmare, you know, like this Hermaher goes because my pronouns is she, her, and they, them. And like, um, not only that, but also I get beaten up, you know, like, I mean, uh, yeah, so it's kind of like I'm thinking of passing more and more, and it's your fault, all of you, to be honest, you know because kind of your boundary board doesn't have a language that we use. I'm joking, it's not your fault, but I mean, it's a society, it's a system. And it's really, it's really difficult to be out and without passing. And um, I'm taking hormones now for one year and uh, like uh, estrogen and testosterone, but like, I'm very happy with it. But if the society and this everyday violence, it's a daily violence. I mean, I, come on, between like, I don't know how many percent they vote for the for AFD, but like, just think that if between each five person, one of them is AFD supporter, uh, I promise you that between each 10 people, nine of them are definitely have no clue what exactly being trans means. Even. So, you know, the knowledge, the language, you know. So I'm facing, I'm living in the society, like in a way that like, um, in every contribute to the people, I have to educate them or I have to just forget who I am and in which world I'm thinking and the language is really building up our mindset, you know. So no, it's not easy to live wherever you are, but as a trans woman of color, because unless you're white and rich, that's a different story. I have to say, if you're rich in this world, it's a different, <laughs> but you know, just to clear this out. So no, Berlin is not paradise, I don't think so, and it's getting worse because like a lot of, more white, hetero, or let's put them cis shit, we call them cis hetero people, are coming to Berlin these days and they are not, they are, they hear that, oh, Berlin is super fun, there are, there is a queer culture, there are clubs, blah, blah, blah. But it's an attitude, it's a culture, it's not just, you know, kink. Actually, queerness is not about being kinky, it's about like uh, questioning different normativity. So, but I would say that I, overall I'm happy living in Berlin much better than Iran, but I guess the LGBTQI in Iran is really getting stronger. When I was living in Iran at the university, even though I had like, you know, like, I, I look very girly and everybody was saying, he's gay, you know? But at the same time, I would say that we were hidden, like we were a couple of people, a small, a few people talking together and we were, we had so much fears. But nowadays, in every demonstration, they bring the flag. I mean, like, it's, it's it, at the time... At You're my, talking about in Iran, right? In like Iran. The, yeah. I mean, like, you see, they write in the vows, they bring the flags, you see the LGBT flag a lot of places, and more and more people... So it's a society, I'm lying if I say 
I am representing Iranian modern society for you today. You know, I, I, I am also old, kind of like a new generation. It's just like it's a different generation. And I guess also like I'm 10 years outside of that place. But I have connection. I know a couple of queer and trans people. And one a story I want to tell you, just I want, don't want to take the time so much, but I guess it's interesting. I, I mean, I, I didn't, I recently had a new one, but this one that became very controversial was actually one year and a half ago uh, with Iran International TV that uh, was, t I talk about my uh, experiences of rape, but recently it was about Me Too movement. But um, I, I want to just to say this, after I had this interview, it was very interesting. A lot of my high school friends, university friends, they texted me. And they were like, hey, I am gay, or I am this, or how we didn't know this, and so on, you know? And I was like, and I am in contact with a couple of them. Uh, even so, we always, when we talk, we are like, what a life, because when we knew that we could do a lot of things together, um, you know, uh, yeah, now that we can do things together, it's impossible, because of course, you know, we are, and then at that time that we could do things together, we were not out somehow, even so, yeah. But I have to say that I was not out, I didn't know what does trans mean, uh, just I have to say this. For me, tra transgender men, people that are like, you know, crazy or like, you know, like uh, you have to really have problems. So I was uh, always taking a distance to, uh, from this one, you know, I couldn't put myself there. But I mean, like, I can say that um, at that time I knew that I'm not a normal kid, of course, you know. Um, I do have some more questions, but maybe we can open it up to the audience um, if anyone has questions either in relation to the film or um, something else. Just don't be afraid that it's my trigger or something, you know. I, I have the power to handle it, I promise. Yeah. Thank you for the presentation and the film. Um, I have a couple of questions indeed, but I mean, I can't ask all of them now, I think. Um, I mean, what was interesting for me f in the film was also like what emerged some questions was the idea of this residue, like this, this, this hair. Like it, uh, I mean, I felt like you have a couple of exes in the film, like maybe three main exes with, with the film tan and like shaving your body. Like that felt like the main axis, and why did you really wanted to focus on this? Like this, this idea of getting rid of hair. Like why was it so central in the film? I mean, I, as audience, I have some answers, but I would like to hear it from you. Thank you. Um, yes, if you mean conceptually, I can put it in this way that it had three uh, like uh, perspective on it. You know, reasons basically like main ones, and the first one was like. Um, as I said earlier about the childhood body and the grown up body, adult body, and the guilt that is being addressed to the mother basically about this experience. Uh, because I mean, uh, if every child, if you touch it or if you kiss, a um, child enjoys it, you know, so it's not, but I carry this experience of pain, you know, like I mean, guilt and so on. And the second reason was also about, uh, you know, like what is, the, what is a male body? What is a female body? What is, uh, you know, uh, what hair could could mean for us, even, you know? Because the film is about rape culture, and I guess this comes to the gender, uh, it has a connection with, of course, the gender identities and, you know, womanhood and manhood. And I guess uh, hairy bodies, uh, stereotypically, I mean, in a stereotype base, if I want to put it, it's more, you know, it's for men, you know? So kind of like, um, uh, this was the second reason that it, had the connection with gender identity and the this is conceptually and the third reason I would say was about racism also and uh, like um, yeah I mean I guess like um, kind of um, as you say as you can see also in the movie there is a blonde woman putting a makeup on me and there is like a, another like a brown woman like not non-white woman let's say shaving my ass you know so kind of like um, yeah so kind of like um, it was important for me to see a non-white story, a non-white body telling this story in a way, you know, and think of this idea of how hair can be seen with races. But out of conceptually, in artistic way, I would say that it was a metaphor 
because like kind of shaving my body uh, causes me to get rid of this trauma, you know? To be able to speak about it. And to get rid of this trauma, you need to be able to talk about it. So only, we have this, well, how the film starts is three short sentence, I feel guilty that I liked it. And um, like uh, another sentence and the third sentence is, I feel, um, I, I become a sh a speechless talking about it. I feel shameful talking about it. And then there is a long silence of seeing this body getting shaved. Until it's fully shaved, I look at the camera, and I, now I dare. Now I can look at you and tell you what has happened to me. So kind of it was artistically also fitting to that point. And um, also body politics kind of, I mean, I love the bathroom as a location because it's the place that in this capitalistic world we don't go naked outside, we don't go to the river, you know, it doesn't have that life, so it's a place that you realistically can see body and there is a water and it gives a rhythm and you can have the foam and visually it's interesting, you can have shaving, you know, like sound of it also uh, gives this, um, kind of transforms the feeling of uh, resistance because uh, it's, uh, that's why also it has a deep root for me into feminism, this film for me, because it's coming from this resistance. And like, um, yeah, so it was, uh, yeah, so it's, I would say that um, it was a resistance and kind of like a metaphor to, that I could psychologically tell you how shame feels about it, how guilt feels about it how I'm destroying myself with it, you know, with this experience, with these uh, uh, experiences of violence. And, um, and I guess uh, my body, I'm experiencing, I'm carrying those experiences until I'm alive with my body, even though this film is made and so on. That experience is always stay with me in different ways. And it made me, of course, another person. And it was a chart, of, I mean, sometimes someone harasses you somewhere and you feel totally upset about this, or someone, you know, you have a, a small memory of your past. But I was a slave. For four years I was listening to, you know, as a child, like, you know, to what I was, uh, what was requested. So uh, what I want to say is that what was being used there was my body. So, uh, so this shaving of this is kind of like going to these memories and like looking at them again and trying to face them even though they are painful to be able to survive somehow or to be able to, let's say here, break the silence and then thus survive myself, survive and then like also perhaps heal others or Courage, other, yeah, you know, like uh, invite others to also share their own experiences, you know. I mean, as audience, I, I, I think I read it like, like shaving, to, like shaving continuously, sort of changing your sh shell, like trying to get rid of your shell and getting another shell, and then like having this as a continuous operation in life. I mean, that's like what being queer is for me. Like that's how I read it. Can Can I ask two more short questions? Yeah, like it's, it's, I have one question about the regime. I loved how you read it, I have to confess. <laughs> thank you, yeah, thank you. Um, it's, it's the one question is like about the choices of regie indeed, like editing, like authorship indeed. Why did you choose to edit this film yourself? Because it's really, I mean, editing is like really hard job. And why did you choose to do this by yourself? Because maybe another editor would have supply you another perspective in this stage? And the third question, briefly, how is the case going with Kurostomi? Uh, the uh, case, the legal case uh, with Kia. Uh, let's, uh, I will get back to that, but uh, back to the question that you told me about, like the, um, uh, I, editing, yes, why I edited myself. This is an interesting question because after this film, I'm always co-editing, but I began cinema kind of from the editing room after the being in front of the camera because I was all the time editing behind the scenes, to be honest, and then later in Dubai, I worked at AM Studio, Advancement, and so on. So I, editing was really on focus at the beginning. But also, as I told you that all the doors were blocked, I mean, like, it's very toxic, but I was really slapping my face to not sleep and edit this movie. You know, so that, that, uh, you know, that's, and I guess no editor could have that, that, uh, <laughs> you know, like that motivation that I had to, to done, you know, to go through this. So I don't know what could be the result. I agree that perhaps uh, it could be also better or worse. I don't know that, but I have to say that 
Yeah, kind of like the material of this therapy and, you know, like the um, matter. It was, I recorded a lot of sessions, you know. I, I was really, like, yeah, just trying to, I, I mean, in first rough cuts, we had like one hour, two hours of just therapy sessions. And so on. of course, you know the process of editing. But just to finalize the, the question, the answer, I have to say that, like, um, this personal theme of it and this motivation and this uh, like uh, triple desire that okay this is my last way you know like uh, kind of, of went I went with the editing I didn't know how it uh, you know like how it went but I really um, yeah I felt comfortable to do it myself and to tell this story myself somehow because kind of especially because of its experimental and it's a fast rate in opposite of Abbas Kiarostami because we talked about <laughs> slow cinema, you know, it's a very fast rhythm. So kind of to explain, to, to put this imagery together, here is the eye and then you go and then you, we end, you know. It was uh, perhaps a little bit more, I mean, I, I agree with you, I, I never want to edit my own films. I, say I always have co-editors and or editor is not me at all, but, um, I'm not that also upset that how one usually should be, that it's you edit your own movie, you know, you don't see a lot of things and so on. And with this one, I'm not that upset about this part of it. And there was a second question about uh, Kiarostami, the court case. Um, I, how can I put this in vote? But I, have, I can just very shortly tell it. Yes, it's for three years after I gained the power, this film was seen, and after I outed myself, like um, that I could talk about these stories and I tried in different ways. There is Guardian is still going on. I had eight, nine times of interview and it was not interviews only with me, it was also with my mother and two other my aunts because we are four women in this movie without contract even, without consent. So it's really a power abuse in different ways. And, um, but I mean, I guess, this is somehow becoming a movie for itself because how the doors were closed there, here also, the, I'm not rich to pay, I don't know, one million to go to M with MCAT to, to the court or something. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So like just as a thing, so I wanna just summarize it. But I mean like, or I'm trying different doors and I guess, uh, I, I, I guess the art starts when all the other, nobody goes first to art, you know, like when the other doors are closed, then perhaps you see, okay, then this is the way to, to uh, rise up awareness, and I have a difficult job with that because it's uh, very, you know, then the, we are dealing with a very big name in different ways, and like, yeah. And, but uh, when you talk about Kurosawa, I like to bring it to the film concept, not talk about that part. And in the film concept, it's a myth, you know, like when I talked about anarchy, this child is coming to not repeat the patterns, you know, to like, uh, yeah, you know, like to, with his own uh, simple language. I would say that, um, yes, this is also another part of it, you know, like uh, that Bring you mentioned. Myth, yeah. yeah, myths, I mean, like we have these authors, male, uh, Godar, uh, Satyaji Ray, Ozu, Kurosawa, Kiarostami, I don't know, Global Kubrick, Hitchcock, you know, and then like they made 50 movies in their life and so on, so, um, like, I'm sorry I use this word. I usually, I'm uh, here uh, um, like uh, a little bit shy, <laughs> but uh, big dick guts, I call them, you know? Like, it's just, uh, all of them. <laughs> yes, they sit, you know? Like, and then, yeah, so it's kind of like, um, yeah, you know, but it should change because it's very uh, something obvious that we all suffer from it. And uh, yeah, many others also suffer from it. Yeah. Um, I don't know how we're doing on time, but yeah, please, go ahead. I, what, take over the mic. Do I need the microphone? Or? Oh, sorry. <laughs> sorry, it's a bit of a continuation of where you just left off, but um, as you said that um, you were not aware of the camera in 10, I was also thinking about uh, the, t the two layers in your film where you were talking about a physical abuse uh, by a family member, and then on the other hand, there is another kind of violation on you as a child without knowing, without giving consent. You're also saying adults who <laughs> were subject to the same thing, but um, you uh, touched upon the side of your choice of using these footage because it kind of also shows your relationship with your mother and the society and also kind of 
a good passage to um, tie it to, yeah, there are a lot of tens going on out there, but to me, it just really feels as an audience that the other layer of violation is really there. And if it's not personal, I was also wondering, like, um, you've been in this film without your knowledge, and then you were, you were a child, then at some point, I, I'm supposing you understood that all these differences of consent and you didn't know this was a film and then you're in that film and the whole world sees it, blah, blah, like, I kind of wanted to hear a little bit about what that uh, process was for you like. I mean, at the time I was 10 years old, but, um, and I, I mean, like, like any other children wanted when they were, adults were talking about something, wanted to play something, you know, do so. so I was not really involved to know, okay, who says what and what are the plans and what is going on. But um, I remember that like everything happened very quickly and I met Kiara Stami several times only and I also wrote uh, more in details because I might now forget some points in my social media about it a couple of months ago. But um, yes, that, uh, I, when I met Kiara Stami, this material that you watched in the whole movie from my side was already filmed. So he knew basically that He's going to use the original material because we never, as non-actors, can act like this, you know? He was aware of this, of course. But then he pretended that, okay, you are going to act in this movie and, you know, like, kind of like this. And then he has also stories with my mother, of course, uh, more because my mother at the time was a 27 years old young painter. She was nobody, absolutely. And Kiara Stami already had a palmator. Uh, with a uh, mm, taste of cherry. So he was at his highest peak of his, so you are like, you know, like, uh, yeah. So uh, there were a lot of abuse of this life, a woman's life in this way that, okay, you have this material, you know, because, uh, yeah, and he was already a brand, he was already a big name. He edited it wisely with his approach of simplicity of knowing what to show and what not to show and how and so on. And then he said he wrote the script and he trained the cast and this, and they wrote that I'm second Marlon Brando in Cayo do Cinema and those kind of things, you know, and how he's a talented director to get acting from non-actors. And yeah, this became a product for the capitalism and for the market and for festivals and so on. So it's a uh, multi-layer, you know this definitely better than me about uh, <laughs> like uh, every production and distribution and so on. So yeah, but um, I guess that I'm not all that hopeless about the whole situation. Uh, as um, in this film we saw, um, I can write, I can uh, make movies, so let's see. I hope so that uh, like, um, yeah, this will be this will have, because my, my struggle is not just now talking about it, but it's important how much this voice of truth has power, you know? Because, you know, if someone like Juliette Binoche now comes and says, oh, this is the story of 10, <laughs> it's, it will be like, very, because Juliette Binoche acted in Kiara Stein's film Certified Copy, and it was his only film. It will be different with me writing on my Instagram that what has happened to me? Do you know what I want to tell you? So it's the power, yeah. Yes, all the time. So. Um, and on that note, I know we're almost running out of time, but I just just to bring it back to kind of uh, the Twister exhibition and and kind of the framework we have uh, here for the exhibition. Do you have um, like as a as as an Iranian uh, queer trans woman filmmaker living um, in Berlin? What are kind of I guess. Uh, your networks of solidarity. Do you see your films? Because you you talked a lot about uh, the you know the queer um, community being very white uh, and so forth. But do do you see your films being kind of in conversation um, with perhaps uh, European films or I don't know the the Iranian because there's a huge Iranian diaspora in terms of the filmmakers as well, is there kind of, are there networks um, that you were a part of um, as, a, as a filmmaker also? Um, do you have these, this, this, this kind of both within Berlin and maybe also greater Europe? Um, um, yes, actually, um, as you know, um, my trilogy will be shown at Ferran Film Festival this year. It's a collaboration with Dos Dortmund Oswald, U, um, U Oswald Dortmund um, Museum. And like, um, 
And then I have a new short film which is in editing and it's exactly about white supremacy and racism kind of, you know. It's about a trans woman who has a fetish of getting pregnant. <laughs> and um, yeah, and then like, while uh, loves white supremacy kind of, you know. So it's, um, I'm, I'm trying to reflect also these experiences. Of course, I'm part of this society and I, when I see injustices and humanistic things, because I guess we people of color, we are dehumanized in different ways and cinema has to humanize something, you know? So like, um, yes, um, I hope so. I guess they are intersectional. They are all connected. It's, it's not, you cannot separate them the topic of rape culture with white supremacy or with gender binary or they are really one connects uh, the other very strongly. And I am part of some networks, yes, but imagine the painter is alone with his uh, canvas, the writer is alone with his uh, book, but when you are making a movie, it's actor, sound person, camera person, editor, assistant, set designer, you know? And then you have to, you know, like, this is different. While you are creating, you have to work with others. Now, of course, painter also should be social, but in the process of creation. And cinema is, because deals with the image and power of image and money more than other medium. So it's more patriarchal and it's normative. And I'm struggling, of course, but um, I'm not hopeless. I have some communities that are uh, here or there, like here now. Um, thank you so, I mean, really, for this chance to be here and present the film. And um, also, yes, there, there are queer collectives that we are working together and queer filmmakers apart from the university. And I guess um, more people of color also are now getting in filmmaking active, which is really a good sign. On that note, I'd like to thank all our audience here as well as online, bless you. Um, and thank the NGBK and Chromatic Wednesdays for hosting us. If you have further questions for Amina, we can um, talk about it over a glass of wine. Good night. Thank you.